coding um, in this this bootcamp page. So uh, as usual, if you would like to code along, um, don't hesitate to um, raise your hand or pop something in the chat, and um, I will uh, gladly uh, slow down a little bit if I'm going too fast. But but otherwise, if we just sort of scroll down this page and have a a quick view at the code, there is quite a lot of code. And uh, you know, if you've come to some of these sessions that I do, I do like some live coding, um, I probably will mostly be copying and pasting and solving the, the flash challenges that are built in here, but quite a lot of code this time. So if you want to code along, this would be good practice for folks. And um, again, don't hesitate to stop if I'm either going too fast or if you encounter a problem, um, we could and probably should use this time to to solve some of those problems for people. So um, if you'd like to do that, now's your chance to fire up your um, R Studio. And um, until then, I'm going to start this and swap the percenter view and just orient my um, presenter screen so that I can see the chat a little bit. If I could ask anybody who's willing to, if anybody notices anybody asking a question in chat and I miss it, just uh, unmute your mic and let me know. And I'll give you just an opportunity now to make any comments or ask any questions before I start. And otherwise, very soon, I'm going to start. I think I'm all ready. There's my pointer. Yes. OK. All right, so um, as with other sessions, this is open to everybody. Um, we're very friendly here, and I hope you uh, would agree. Um, something that someone asked me by email was, um, you've been doing this boot camp for a few weeks, and I uh, missed all the first ones. When can I join? When are you going to run it again? And my answer to that would be, don't hesitate. Come on in now. Um, I have designed the boot camp to be uh, drop-in friendly, so uh, somebody could still benefit, I believe, by uh, just dropping in. So forward this on if if you think anybody would be interested. I was trying in a fumbling way to explain this sumo wrestling picture to uh, Megan. Uh, Maybe I, I could even invite Megan to explain her interpretation of my explanation, but I won't do that. Uh, instead, I'll, I'll say that um, the reason for this sumo wrestling picture is that uh, being able to manipulate your data is, is a powerful skill, powerful like a, like a sumo wrestler, perhaps. I know it's not a perfect metaphor, but um, it's... It's something that we do, grappling with the shape of our data. One of the common solutions to this is having many, many spreadsheets. But a best practice would dictate that if you have a, a single file, oftentimes you, you can have a single master file with your data. And assuming the data are correct, uh, we would exploit that single file just with code to uh, subset it, to make... Um, to make data transformations, to explore the data, and uh, and then to construct maybe a um, uh, a final version or a subset of the data. We tend to want to document our. Some people are surprised when I say this, but we tend to want to document even imperfections that are recorded at the time of the data. Because if we if we make a decision to exclude data that um, that later causes a problem. We don't have a breadcrumb trail to to fall back on, and if we can subset our data with with code, then um, then uh, we can always find our way back to the original data, and and maybe a different decision could be made. Okay, so <clears throat> this is a strong skill, is my point. Now to uh, do data subsetting, we need to address something that we've barely mentioned so far, and it's the so-called indexing concept in computer programming languages. So we're going to talk about what that means and how it works. It, it is very simple, but it's something that even the cleverest amongst us can't do without some knowledge uh, of it. 
one way to do indexing that's the built-in way in R is uh, it's through this function called which. It uh, subsets data by criteria that we define. We can. It's very easy to define simple criteria, um, but you can define very complex criteria, compound criteria. So we'll practice some uh, examples with that. We'll um, we'll practice that first with some typical data objects, some um, vectors and matrices. But but really, we talked about data frames last time, and that's what most of us are here for. And after the session today, we'll be performing um, most of our operations on data frames. So uh, we'll talk about how selection works on data frames too. And then finally, we'll talk about summarizing data. It's often, I do this all the time, <clears throat> um, where I, uh, let's say I have a factor and a dependent variable, and I want to um, create data summaries like means and standard deviations according to some, some factor. Well, the built-in way to R to do that is the aggregate function. It's extremely powerful. I think it's underused by uh, people beginning to use R. So uh, we'll look at that as well. I think we're going to um, be stretched for time, even though I don't have that many slides. So, um, so we'll do that. So the first thing we're going to talk about is um, vectors, matrices, and arrays. These are some of the basic data structures we have already looked at and played with in R and uh, thinking about indexing. And um, to, to look at this, to think about this, I think I'm just going to draw a little picture of this um, while I'm thinking about it, is uh, here's what I mean about thinking of it as houses on a street. Let's say that you have a, a vector of data. We can kind of visualize this vector like this, and let's say that um, we can imagine this as a as a street, and there are houses on the street. And uh, now here, I've, this kind of looks like a street. These brackets that I've made, but it's it's a symbol for um, <clears throat> for a vector in the computing world. Here, I've actually drawn the houses right on the middle of the street. Uh, it's not not a perfect analogy here, but uh, in the houses live our data. We might have numerals, you know, just just some um, to some integers. And um, well, like houses on a street, each of these um, houses might have an address. So the address of the first house might be one, two, three, four and five for this vector that's got five values. Uh, that could go on to um, you know any very large number indeed. The point I'll just say is that um, in R, the first address in a vector or the the first address in a, any dimension of um, of a matrix or array is one. In many um, computing languages, it starts with zero. Uh, this is a source of a lot of confusion in R for people who are not. Or who are programmers and have encountered other languages, but it's meant to be easier for people who aren't programmers to start using R, right? And the whole point of this is that um, we can access a subset of the data, like say these first three values, by grabbing uh, and, and indexing, so to speak, the first three addresses. Okay, so that's what we're going to play with directly here. So uh, we're going to look at the indexing um, concept by creating a vector. And we've done some code like this before. Now I'm just going to flip over to the um, to the web page, go down to the indexing concept, and I'm going to start a um, a script just as normal. And I'm going to go ahead and save my script. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and save my script um, uh, here. Overwrite the script that I've already got there. There we go. Now I've got nothing. And I'm just going to uh, make a simple index of section 2.1. Try to keep up with my indexing. Now, in the past, I've talked about best practices to make a header with um, two 
is programming, what you're programming, and uh, when last edited, and also a uh, contents page with this funny syntax, just to remind you with a starting with um, at least one hash. I like to use two hashes just as a visual cue that there's a section in my code and um, the last four. And, and when we have that, we get a clickable table of contents. Forgot a, one of my header. We get a clickable, clickable table of contents over here, down here, and we also get foldable sections that are useful as our, as our code starts to get more complicated. So um, I'll let you um, do that, but for now, just going to um, mouse over the code block and uh, just copy it and paste it. Now, what we're doing in this code is we're creating a vector with the C function that just, just creates some data, and then we're asking the butler to uh, print it for us. So three, two, one, boom, boom. Okay, so we've echoed our first command, and now we've printed out the data. No problem. Now, what are we going to do with this vector? Remember, this is like the street, and each of these uh, places um, has a has an address on the street. Make that a little bigger for you. Notice that there's a one here. R in the console gives us a visual cue of that address for any vector. Um, and if this were long enough to wrap around, if I were to make a um, uh, um, the numbers, you know. Uh, <clears throat> a thousand random numbers. As the numbers wrap around, the indices show um, for each individual value. So this is 966. This one's not labeled, but 967, 968, 969, uh, 970 and then 971 wraps around again. So that's what's happening there. Now, what are we going to do with this? Well, um, I just give a little box here that shows explicitly what the addresses are for the, each of these values. You know, a way that we can index that is with a square bracket syntax. And if we look at the, you know, the first five values, and this is the sixth value, we can access that sixth value by the address. So let's do that. Three, two, one down in the console. There we go. So this is just the you know bare taste of the usefulness of these indices. So uh, in 2.2, what we're going to do is um, practice with some of these indices a little bit more. I'm just going to make a new section here. and copy this code, paste it over. Now my, um, I've made my text large so that you can read it, but that makes my screen wrap around a lot. So we'll have to bear with me for um, reading the long comments that I put in there. But uh, we've got our vector. Um, I'll just make it again and it will overwrite the value that's up here. Um, but it's the same values, I believe. So three, two, one. There we go. And uh, we can return all the values from my vector by running line 24, three, two, one. And uh, we've already done that. Um, if we use the square syntax and don't put anything in it, we have done this before, but to remind you, um, if we if we explicitly use the square bracket syntax, but don't put any values, it implies that we want all the values. So line 25 should also deliver all the values, three, two, one, it does. And uh, we can be explicit about um, wanting all of the addresses. So one colon 10, but just sub select that and run it three, two, one. Remember, we have looked at this before, it's shorthand for a sequence of integers. So this will also return all the values, three, two, one. Okay, so we're manipulating the addresses to get at the values inside. I know that this is a bit abstract, 
um, if, if all you want to do is perform an analysis of variance. But trust me, this is one of the skills that you will come back to you and make use of. All right, so um, what if we just want to grab a subset? Here's one to three. Here's one, two, three. And if we put that inside the vector, three, two, one, it gives us the first three values. And likewise, we can pick and choose some values. Now, ordinarily, we wouldn't exploit the syntax to do this by manually inputting the uh, the values, although you do sometimes do this. We usually would automate some process, which we'll look at um, directly, to, uh, to pick um, indices that correspond to a certain value. Okay, but nevertheless, we can choose the fifth and ninth address and we if we do that if we do it this way we have to enclose this in the in the combine um, function three two one we get the uh, fifth and nine values all right so um we just briefly go back to, to this uh vectors um are the one we just looked at and now we want to look at matrices now remember um, vectors are a single dimension that have all of the same kind of data. So it could be numeric with um, decimals, it could be integers, it could be um, characters, it could be anything. Matrix has, has two dimensions. Um, now, a, a characteristic of the matrix is that the whole matrix has to contain the same class of data. Um, and that'll be a distinction from a data frame that um, can have different kinds of classes of data contained within it. So uh, we did already play with this, um, but uh, let's just look at the code and we'll redo it again. So let's make a new section, 2.3. And we're going to copy that code and migrate it over. There we go. So this is a big chunk of code. Let's just walk through it here. So um, let's just go over to, uh, oh, I've, I've collected a large amount of code here. What have I done? Oh, God, what have I done? Go. So I think that I um, want to look at where I'm at here and make sure I got the right piece of code there. I'm going to undo that. There we go. I just want 2.3. There we go. OK, and if I go back to 2.3, here I am. Matrices, I'm just going to remove that from our clickable table of contents. So we're going to use the matrix function. Um, remember, you can use help to remind yourself of the arguments in the data function, uh, make in any function using its name. Uh, or if you just put your cursor in it, you can hit your F1 key. And it will bring up the matrix help page. That's the default hotkey in um, Windows in our studio. <clears throat> if you're on a Mac, you uh, can explore what your um, function is to uh, bring up the, the help page. The arguments that we need are the data argument. We need to pass a vector of data to make our matrix, the number of rows, and whether or not the matrix is populated by rows or by columns. OK, so let's make our matrix three, two, one. Let's print out our matrix three, two, one. There it is. So we've printed out our matrix. It's got two rows and it's populating by row. Since it's by row and there are two rows, we know that those should be the top row. Two, three, four, five. We do see that two, three, four, five. Then six, 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 six. The world is working as we expect it to work. I like to test that sometimes being a statistician and all. All right, so there's this concept of slicing. We often might want to slice out um, a matrix um, by, by row or by column. So a way to slice out the first column is uh, notice how the dimensions of the matrix within the um, brackets are designated with this comma that I've highlighted here on line 52. So if I want the first row, I specify row one uh, and leave the, 
the column designation blank, implying that I want all the columns. So uh, three, two, one. There we go. And uh, likewise, I can pick just a single column and specify all the rows. Three, two, one. Oops, I've misspelled matrix. Let's spell it correctly and try that. There it is. It works. I have to um, make a note of that and fix that typo. I was just bragging to Megan that I've never made a typo before earlier, but there's my first one ever. Okay. Um, matrix columns and rows, uh, we can access them by name. So this is also useful when working with matrix data. I was just working with some matrix data this morning that was a 10 by 10 sampling array, uh, I think on a couple of meters, maybe 10 meters between the arrays within fields for soil and um, pests and, and also ground beetles for biodiversity. And uh, I was using the names function for the matrix to exploit it. Let's see what names are in this matrix. I haven't assigned any names, so there shouldn't be any three, two, one. And indeed, we get a null value. Um, we can also have a utility function for matrices in the shape of the in row function. It'll tell us how many rows are in a matrix. It's not so interesting for a small matrix. Ours only has two rows. We specified that after all. But when you have large matrices, this becomes um, really useful. And uh, in addition to the names, the generic names attribute of the matrix, we can also use the function row names to ask just what the row names are, three, two, one. So a neat thing about this row names function, you know, we don't have any uh, value in this function that calls and shows us the attribute of the row names for our matrix. Neat thing about it, though, is that we can assign values to this um, to this feature of our matrix. So what if I wanted to call the rows um, dogs and cats? Maybe this is the count of dogs and cats uh, that people have. So three, two, one. Now we've assigned the names. And if I print out our matrix, three, two, one. Now it prints the names that we've just um, assigned it to. And uh, we can also get them with the row names function, three, two, one. Okay. So, um, you know, there's a flash challenge here. We could name the columns of, of our matrix with A, B, C, and D, right? So um, the way we would do that is um, use the call names function. And uh, into that, we would use with a combined function, these quantities, three, two, one, print out our new matrix. And now we have our uh, matrix named dogs and cats, A, B, C, D. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, having done that, you can um, exploit slicing the matrix, indexing the row and column names. You do that in double quotes for the names that you've assigned. So let's say that we wanted the, uh, the dogs row comma, and the B and D column. And if we specify more than one, because the comma separates rows and columns um, in the columns section, we need to use the combined function. And so it's a, it starts to get a little messy when we do this. And this is an unusual way. It's just to demonstrate how this works. So we should get uh, the values three and five which are in the dogs row, the B and D columns. So three, two, one. And indeed, that's what we get. Interestingly, it drops the row name, but it keeps the column names here. Sometimes that's useful you can exploit that. And then um, we also can use um, other kinds of functions to act on values. So here I've wrapped this code on line 75 that has the number three and five have wrapped the mean function around it. And um, this is to make the point that um, numeric functions, if you have a numeric matrix, will act on the uh, the sliced 
values of your matrix. So let's see if that works. Three, two, one. And it does, of course. Okay. Now, um, I mentioned that we've got this, oops, I mentioned that the which function, that is um, here, this is one that we use all the time. It's one that is um, uh, used to create a, a phrase. Now, I think we talked about this kind of phrase before that has a, um, a um a logical operator you know this is the greater than sign and uh, we call this a, a boolean expression try to draw with my pen instead of my mouse and um what boolean expressions return is um is uh a vector of trues and falses. And now th this is an interesting thing because uh, within that that square bracket matrix in some vector, we can actually pass a Boolean expression and uh, exploit that and, and falses will be excluded from our, our slice of the data. So this is one that we use very typically. We use it all the time. So I'm just going to go to the website and um, go down to the, the matrix section here where we're using the which function. Um, now we're in section three. Okay, so here I'm tipping the hat for you to bring up the help function. Um, if you want. So we're just going to make a vector called vector A. We're going to put some values in it. Three, two, one. It's going to pop up up in the global environment. Here it comes. Okay, so we've got our number. And um, here's that Boolean expression I just tried on and look down on the console. Three, two, one. So uh, what we see is um, for every one of these values, the Boolean expression resolves to a, a false or a or a true. So um, everything up to this part of the vector is not greater than five, uh, but everything at the end, these three values are greater than five. So we have all falses, two trues. Okay. So um, if we if we use the which function on it, the which returns the addresses where there's a positive um, return on the Boolean. And the addresses where um, there's a positive return are 8, 9, and 10. And uh, if I don't go on to it, um, just briefly show here anyway, that if we if we put that inside the square brackets, we can use the addresses to get the values, three, two, one. So we get the uh, values that adhere to, to this Boolean expression. This is very powerful. We use this all, all the time with data frames. Um, so we'll work our way up to that. I'm gonna save and uh, go back to the web page. All right. <clears throat> So um, I anticipated that that was the whole point of this, and I've got a, another little example with um, with a different kind of data. So I'm just going to copy that and um, paste that in. So um, now here, there's something funny going on because the word we is um, highlighted in this color and. This is a funny old thing because it's a feature of our studio that they introduced about a little bit less than a year ago or so, I, if I recall correctly, where um, character strings that also represent colors in the R palette 
uh, are highlighted by the color that they represent. So goldenrod is, by the way, my favorite art color of all time. I use it sparingly because I don't want to want it to stay special for me. But wheat is also a color. But in this case, I don't mean it to be a color. I mean uh, these two crops are like wheat and maize. So I've got a vector of a character string with these values. It's going to pop up over here in the data um, global environment, 3, 2, 1. There it is. So we've got our character vector here. It's a it's um, character type, and it's got the first few values. Now, um, the equal equal sign is another Boolean syntax uh, tool. Equal equal means is equivalent to. Why not just a single equals? You recall that um, we have this this one. If I type it down in the uh, console. Maybe maybe that's it's better to type it up here. The um, the assignment operator in R is this little arrow symbol, a less than and a dash with no spaces. But we can also use one equal as an assignment operator. Um, <clears throat> because the equals is an assignment operator, um, I think I I've mentioned before that. We use this assignment operator that I've highlighted to uh, assign values from from the right hand side to the left hand side when we're outside of a function, and we use this equal sign to assign values from the right hand side to the left hand side when we're inside of a function for argument values. And as an aside, something I may not have mentioned before. We can also use the assignment operator directionally to assign something on the left hand side to a data object on the right hand side. So it is directional. All right, so um, the equal equal is a Boolean expression though, and it asks whether the values in the care vector are equivalent to the uh, character string wheat. So let's see what happens. It should resolve to a Boolean, three, two, one does and it just gives us trues where there's wheat okay and if we use the which function around it it should resolve the uh, addresses of those trues so it should say uh you know one three five six three two one and it does now um now we're getting interesting because we could exploit a a factor or a uh, a character string in an experiment in a data frame, we could get the the rows where values are equal to some some treatment, for example. Okay, so, but how that works in a vector is if we um, pass our character vector, the which function where the character vector equals wheat, we should just get the um, the four values that uh, adhere to wheat. Now this. This structure here is kind of complex because we're next nesting a couple of commands. And if you select the commands, we can run them one at a time. This is a powerful way to explore somebody else's code to understand how it works. For example, I can um, do the same Boolean, three, two, one, get the true, false, true, false, true, true. I can then select the which function, three, two, one, to get the addresses, and then it's easier to understand that those addresses are passed to the square bracket syntax 3, 2, 1 to get the values. Um, now, uh, likewise, I mentioned that the Booleans are fair to pass as well. So if we, if we just get the Booleans, 3, 2, 1, and we just pass that, it will, um, the vector will pick up on the trues. And we can do it that way too, three, two, one. Why would we do it both ways? Well, there are some situations where we wanted to to, um, to index uh, a number of, of the addresses in a vector or an array and maybe combine them in a compound expression. But uh, for simple um, slices, we don't need to do that. Okay. So I have just explained in my own words in explaining that, why 
those two pieces of code have identical outputs. Any comments or questions? We doing OK? OK, if there's nothing, I'm going to continue so that we can have time to finish. Now um, I'm going to move on to the data frame. It's probably the most interesting case on this page. Go ahead and look and catch up on the slides. <clears throat> so um, the the data we're going to use is a built-in data set called Orchard Sprays. I'm not going to read in a new data set. You typically will be reading in a data set, but for quickness and for examples, we're just going to use this um, this data set called Orchard Sprays. And um, in it, there is a a uh, syntax called uh, I mean a variable called treatment. So if you recall, just bring back my my pin. If you recall, um, in order to access some data that are inside of a data frame, a data object floating in our space, we have to use the cache symbol. Um, and that opens up the box of the, the data frame, and we can access the variable by name. Now, um, let's go to the web page and get down to the code part of this where we're doing this. I'm just going to copy the first one. It's a chunk of code and it's section 4.1. OK, <clears throat> so. Um, we're going to first um, just load up the, the orchard sprays thing. I'm going to clear my environment and and show you that it loads up three two one notice that um when we load it up we haven't used it yet and there's a little memory trick that our studio does that, that it designates the uh, data within the data object orchard sprays a promise it promises the data is there it's only going to take up your memory when you use it let's just print out a little bit of it three two one here we go since we used it since we asked for it now we have the whole um, data object and we can kind of have a look at the structure of it. But um, what this is, is a, um, if I just put my cursor there, hit F1 and bring up the help for an explanation <clears throat> where um, the, the decrease variable is a numeric response or uh, whatever they're measuring here. And you can, you can read about it. It's um, it's a, a pesticide sprays in orchard in um, how how they affect honeybees. Okay, and this is a kind of experiment called a Latin square. This is a classic, old-fashioned, quite old-fashioned, <clears throat> still sometimes useful agriculture experimental design based on ANOVA. Okay, so we have um, in an array, we have a row and a column position. The rows and the columns, uh, what a Latin square design does is um, you have different treatments like A, you know, B, C, uh, C, A, B, and B, C, A. So uh, this would be an example of a Latin square design where none of the um, rows and columns like Sudoku um, are in the same order, and it's a way to minimize um, correlation and minimize your sample size. Okay, we're not going to worry about that too much, um, but there were a lot of treatments in this one, so the the matrix was much bigger. You can see that there are 64, so there are eight by eight um, treatments, and they're just generically labeled, um, you know, A, B, C, etc. Okay, so um, we scroll down, we can um, uh, look at the structure. I have this function in looking at the structure before I go on. This prints out the same thing that's displayed up in the global environment. In the in the olden days, um, we would use the structure variable to, to give a view of that. But in, in the modern 
easy living days of uh, our studio. We have a visual cue without even asking for it, but I, I still like to leave it in there. I still do use it occasionally. Now we're not going to um, we're not going to worry about box plots yet. We'll talk about graphing later on, but I just want to graph the dependent variable, the decrease in bees relative to the treatment data. It's going to be orchard sprays, and then I put a title and some X and Y labels on it. So let's have a look at the data. It'll pop up over in graphs. Three, two, one. So um, <clears throat> the decrease uh, is measured in this case by the amount of uh, sucrose consumed by pollinators in this experiment by uh, little things that are, I think to figure this out, I had to go back to the book that the data are from. I can't remember. I've done that for a few of these built-in classic data sets that are quite old. But uh, this is what the data looks like. There's a strong pattern across <clears throat> this treatment. And it looks like the um, the amount of decrease in sucrose um, increases across the um, the treatment letters from A to H. Okay. And um, if we see what I'm trying to do here, if I plot out the um, the actual Latin square of the design, it would look something like this with respect to the treatments. And what, what we should see if you look closely at this is that none of the treatments are adjacent to each other by rows or columns, and none apply um, more than once in any row or column. Okay, so. That's what we're doing there. Okay, so um, I think I have done that there. What we're going to do here is we're going to practice slicing out some of the rows in this um, in this data set. So I'm just going to do that in section 4.2. See what we've got. First thing I'm going to do is uh, what if we wanted to slice out all the rows in our data that were for treatment D? We just kind of look at it. Um, you see that it's um, it's a factor, and we've got those D's all sliced in there. Even with a small data set like this, if we wanted to get the rows for the D column, you know, it's not it's not totally trivial. And if we wanted to do that for each variable, this would be a non-trivial task, you know, a manual task in Excel. And then if we did all that and we decided, oh, I want to do something different, it would just be all wasted work. Um, now to do this, I recommend the first time when you do this yourself, um, to think in terms of pseudocode. Remember that pseudocode technique is one where you, you break down a big problem uh, into smaller steps, and then you only have the problem of how to convert those small steps into, um, into code. And each one is fairly easy rather than a big, complicated problem. So the pseudocode for this might be to make a Boolean expression where we identify um, the treatment value is D. Then to use the which function to get the um, indices of the true values for our Boolean. And then to use the square bracket syntax on our data frame to, to slice out the, the rows. OK, so here's, here's what we do. I've just printed out the treatment. I've already done that, so I'm not going to do it again. We create a, an expression that gives us trues and falses for where the Ds occur, three, two, one. So this is not much better than our letters, maybe even worse. It's hard to read, but uh, never fear. We're going to use the which to um, pluck out the true values, three, two, one. Now that looks about right. How many should we have? If it's a perfectly valued, balanced 64 um, length Latin squares, then there should be um, uh, 60, the square root of 64 of each value. And indeed, there are eight. So um, what we're going to do is um, 
put this index of the values we want into a vector called my selection. But we don't have to do this. We could just like we used to do. We, we just like we did a, above, we could pass this highlighted expression right into the square syntax. That would be pretty hard to read. And imagine if we wanted to, to select two treatments or, or more, it would start to get really hard to read. So instead, we're going to dump those into a, a new variable, 321. Let's look in that variable, 321. So now we have that. And now we can exploit that variable with the square bracket syntax for orchard sprays. So let's print it out, 321. And we get just the sliced out um, rows. Now, take my word for it. If you work with R to do almost anything, you will use this very soon and you'll use it often. Very, very useful. Now, it um, it says the um, there's a flash challenge, so we can select and print all the rows where call position uh, equals two. So let's have a look at that. Print it out three, two, one, um, and so it looks like um, you know we're we're just wanting to slice out the second column. That's this column right here. If I've if I've made that weird graph correctly, so uh, we want to build this up. Call position equal to two, three, two, one. There we go. Looks like it's in order. Picking my my trues in order. Wrap that in the which function. There we go. Put that into a variable. This is a terrible name for a variable because it has no meaning. And then we can pass that variable to orchard sprays with a square syntax. Remember, these are columns. So we're going to slice out the columns. Make a space for it. It's rows on the left side, columns on the right. Three, two, one. Whoops, what have we got? What have I done? Undefined columns selected. Three, two, one. Oh, I remember. I remember now. What is my question here? Question is uh, see, I want to select these just from the second column. But so we actually do need the rows. Us. Yeah, we do need the rows where column position is two. Yeah, so we I had to even I had to think about that for just a second. So to grab the column position two, we did need to exploit the uh, the rows um, for that because naturally the um, column position is is a column uh, on a vector, and each vector has an address, and in a data frame. The addresses uh, correspond to rows. OK. OK. Let's see where we're at here. Now, um, the last thing is the aggregate. I think we just have enough time to do this. Let's go down here. Now, the aggregate function summarizes data. Um, The way that we use it is um, with uh, calling the aggregate function. And there are a couple of parameters that we have to set. And there's a little bit of weird stuff that you just get used to after you use it a few times. But the uh, x argument is the variable that you want to summarize. The by argument is. Um, Usually a factor or or something like that that you want to summarize. Here we're gonna um, summarize the the treatment factor. So each level of each treatment will aggregate the decrease data, and uh, we also have to add in the fun, the function, of course, that stands for. Um, and here we're gonna add in uh, we're gonna apply the mean. So what we should get is a mean 
of the decrease for each treatment level. That's our thing. Now there is a peculiarity here in the by argument in that um, we must use a list class of object um, to pass to the by function. So usually we just do that like this. We use the list function to make the um, the factor or whatever the um, variable we're we're aggregating by. We, we make it a list on on the fly. OK, so um, let's go ahead and grab that. We're in section five now, so we'll make another little. Clickable table of contents entry. Back to the top. OK, so um, it's always good practice to bring up the help function. <clears throat> we did just talk about what it's like. This one has a lot of uh, usage types up here. Um, but the simplest one is is like this. The one that we will almost always use uh, involves these three arguments. That's the example that I'm about to show you. And we do have some other arguments that are very useful, but uh, let's just keep it simple for this. So uh, the first one is the code that I showed on the slide. Um, we're using the orchard sprays decreased data, three, two, one. It's just a bunch of integers. We're um, using the treatment data. Three, two, one. Here, I've gone a little extra step of naming the treatment data treatment. The, the reason I do that is to simplify the way the output is, which you'll see in a moment. And when we apply the list function to it, um, it will make a, a list class object that will, it will assign to this and uh, then just apply the mean to it. So let's just do this and see what happens. Three, two, one. Now, um, this name <clears throat> treatment came out because um, I, I have this syntax, the treatment equal to the list, and we have a mean value for each of those levels of the treatment. This is exactly what we express, uh, expected. And a neat thing about this pattern is that if you have a cheat sheet or a little script of useful code snippets, you can recycle this <clears throat> little code snippet for every aggregation you ever do. It doesn't get any more complicated. And other than that little weird thing about the list, <clears throat> it um, it uh, is very easy to use. Here's exactly the same code that just changes the the function to standard deviation, the SD function, three, two, one. Um, and uh, likewise, what if we wanted to get the mean, the standard deviation, and the range? We can use a slightly different syntax here where we are defining our own function inside the uh, fun argument. So our function is going to be defined as a as the mean, where we're going to calculate the mean of x, standard deviation, SD of x, and the range, the range of x. What is x? Well, we set x equal to our dependent variable. So we should get all, all three of those. Three, two, one. Now the naming of um, the aggregate function is weird, um, but here we get the uh, treatment. We get a, a mean, a standard deviation, and the lower and the upper range. Now, uh, we can figure out what these are, um, but I've named them again here so that they, they designate um, this is the mean of x. So the passive aggressive butler is named this x dot mean, and likewise x dot sd, x dot range one, because that's the lower range and x dot range two. I've always been annoyed by the way the aggregate function names these. I have learned to live with it. So um, mileage may vary there. All right. The other thing we can do is we can make a data frame, a new data object that we can use in an analysis. And we just do that by putting the contents and assigning it from the result of this aggregate into something else. OK, so we're going to pop this down and we can see the my mean pop up over here into the data area three, two, one. 
There it is. <laughs> and um, if we just print that out. Oops, I haven't run that one yet. If we just print that one out. We can see that indeed there are eight observations of the two variables um, here. Now, because we I didn't assign this a name or anything, it, the butler has named this X for us because um, that's the name of what we passed to it. We can do this for the standard deviation, three, two, one. And I print that out to you. Yeah, we can we can tidy this up uh, by using the data frame function. So um, <clears throat> we can um, we can look inside the my mean uh, object, pull out the treatment data. We can um, call that treatment with the assignment operator. We can pull out the mean from my mean, that's the X value, and we can pull out the standard deviation from my SD with X, package that with the data frame function and make a new data set. So it'll pop up up here, three, two, one. That's our new data and it, the naming is nice. This drives me crazy, so I usually do this extra little step. I think the last thing that we have time to do, <clears throat> we just heard the um, the bell go off, and uh, I noticed that it went off right at five o'clock. Have any of you ever noticed that that clock, until before I went to South Africa, was about four minutes late? It has been four minutes late for about six months, so they must have fixed it while I was gone. It's the first time I noticed that. Um, now there's a lot going on in this graph um, and the making of this graph. I'm not going to explain everything, but um, in essence, if we make a bar plot on our new data on the mean values, I'm setting the limits of it and I'm labeling the axes. If I just make that bar plot, three, two, one, looks like that. A very fun thing, th these are the, um, <clears throat> These are the mean values. This looks similar to the pattern for that box plot I made before. The way that bar plots are made in R is a funny thing. A lot of people want to make bar plots, one of the simplest bar types. But if you want to label them something interesting, you have to know the numeric value of the position of these bar centers. You might guess that the numeric value is one, two, three, four, et cetera. But uh, if we actually put that object into a variable, and we print that out, you'll see three, two, one, that the bar centers are not actually at the uh, values one, two, three, four. They're always at some decimal value. Now there is a um, graph theoretic reason for this, which I'm not gonna go into now, unless you beg, which in which case I'll do it next time because we're at, running out of time. And it's not that interesting anyway, but um, it's often nice to exploit the fact that um, we can do stuff. The, one of the great frustrations for new users is the fact you can't get a simple bar chart, chart with, um, with error bars and nice tidy labels. So I thought in this, this example, I'd just show you how to do it. First, we're gonna put arrow markings. Now arrows are a kind of, um, linear symbol that have an arrowhead on them. And I'm going to um, put them on the X location at these bar center locations because I want them right in the middle of the bar. And then for the Y locations, I'm going to start them at the mean, which is the top of all of these bars. And I'm going to um, end the arrows at the mean plus the standard deviation. So I want to draw a whisker on each of these that's one standard deviation. And I am um, I'm going to keep the angle, the arrowheads. I'm going to make the angle 90 degrees so that there's a little hinge. And I'm going to make them quite short, length of 0.1. So I'm really just demonstrating what can be done. Three, two, one. There's one standard deviation. They're a bit ugly, 
standard deviations are an ugly thing. A lot of scientists um, don't like to put standard deviations. They like to put standard errors because the standard errors are very small, especially when our sample sizes are small. But I think that's a little, little bit dishonest most of the time. Now I'm using the axis function. Um, and the axis is going to label the um, the treatment levels. I'm going to put it on side one. That's the x axis. I'm going to put it at the bar center locations, and the labels themselves are going to be the names of the treatments. Three, two, one. There you have it. Now uh, we're out of time for the flash challenge, so I'll leave that one to you. Um, and also the the exercises are a thing that I will leave for each of you. Um, George has missed the picture of her dog that I've included in these lectures, but one day she may come back to the Herrick meetings and she will see her dog. That's all that I've got. Any comments or questions? I'm going to stop the recording. I think the, the next time we'll um,